I would like to start by welcoming you to IFCT's webinar, Thinking Beyond Efficacy, Four Key Considerations for Achieving Commercial Success for Cell Therapies. We are proud to present you today's webinar with the financial support of Invitec. I'm Brian Hanrahan, Program Manager for Cell Therapy at Invitec. I'll be the Chair of this webinar and am joined today by our speakers, Michael Paglia, Mark Curtis, and Richard Grant. Before we get started, I'd like to allow our conference operator to briefly go over the format for this webinar. There will be two parts. The presentation component of the webinar will last 45 minutes, comprising three 15-minute presentations. Following this, there will be a 15-minute Q&A session. Should the Q&A session extend beyond the allotted hour, those who are able to stay on the webinar are welcome to. Today's webinar will be recorded and available to participants after the webinar. You may post written questions throughout the presentation by using the chat box located to the lower left corner of the screen. After the presentation has been completed, questions will be addressed during the subsequent Q&A session. Thank you. So, as cell therapy companies progress toward commercial manufacture with potential gain changes, such as cures for cancer and diabetes, the industry could be on the verge of significant breakthroughs. However, with no real commercial success stories to date, the question is raised, what core attributes are required to achieve commercial success? Since early 2004, Invitec has worked with organisations dedicated to cell therapy and regenerative medicine, helping them develop and implement commercial scale manufacturing for a wide range of therapies. During this time, we have identified five key elements that are essential for achieving commercial success. First consideration is, of course, efficacy, as without efficacy, there is no therapy. However, today, we would like to focus on the other four core attributes required to achieve commercial success. To do that, we have Michael Paglia from Uber Bio, who's going to talk about the importance of needle-to-needle -needle logistics, then I'll pass over to Richard Grant from Invitec to discuss the importance of manufacturability and cost of goods. And finally, Mark Curtis with the Centre for, Regen for Commercialisation of Regenerative Medicine, or CCRM, will discuss new ways of looking at the reimbursement landscape. To get us started, I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Michael Paglia. Michael is the Senior Director of Tech Cooperations and Head of the Cellular Process Development and Manufacturing Operations Group at Foodbird Bio. Foodbird Bio is a clinical stage company committed to developing potentially transformative gene therapies for severe genetic diseases and T-cell you know, based immunotherapies. Michael and his group are responsible for the development, scale-up, characterization, technology transfer, and manufacturing of the autologous hemopoietic stem cell and CAR T cell manufacturing processes. Michael joined Bluebird Bio in 2011 and has directed the successful completion of process transfers and compatibility programs in support of ongoing clinical studies. Michael. Great, thanks for the introduction, Brian, and thank you for the introduction as well as the invite from ISCT sponsors, Invitec, and really the invitation to be part of the webinar today. I appreciate that. So Bluebird Bio is a publicly traded company, and these slides contain or may contain forward-looking statements and information. So as all you, you all know, patient safety is central to a scalable needle-to-needle -needle strategy. What I've highlighted here today in this diagram is an overview of some of the elements that I'll talk about today. So obviously the strategy on traceability involves a complex supply chain. The supply chain for autologous and allogeneic products start with enrollment and procurement, are, but slightly different from there on. They require a scalable packout and manufacturing solution, and these solutions must also link to an expedited disposition, reliable storage, and shipment that maintain product traceability up to dose administration. So each of these elements I'll touch on briefly during this webinar today, and subsequently others will go into more detail on some of these elements as well. The 
Potential overarching goals to enable this strategy involves cross-functional elements for quality, scalability, sustainability, and of course, cost of goods. For quality, it's critical to maximize product and process consistency, reliability, and reproducibility. The solutions, of course, must be scalable with care to minimize process changes required at each level of scale up or scale out, while always considering the complexity of the supply chain. While still being sustainable, the ability to drive continuous improvements is, of course, important, but always anticipate the comparability that needs to be demonstrated or a process improvement and then thinking about the comparability in that way. And of course, always do your best to consider the cost of goods as early in the process as possible without compromising the safety or the product quality. Some of the mechanisms to enable this strategy can be summarized as the ability to reduce both internal and technical barriers. For internal barriers, one option is to build expertise in laboratories to evaluate, optimize, and troubleshoot process issues and define technology transfer processes for QC assays as well as manufacturing and systems. Because any process, clinical or commercial success, starts with process understanding. So the earlier and the more robust that build can be, the more focused one can be on addressing questions as they arise. Of course, for later stage programs, it becomes even more critical to build either the in-house development, partner with a strong academic facility, select a highly capable CMO, or really rely on a combination of all of the above. Integrate the knowledge of the CMO, the facility, the academic partner into the plan, and having clear expectations as to the documentation, the processes are really fundamental to the success under any of these scenarios. Overall, working closely with the vendor as a partner and having clear points of contact via, via a vendor manager will really help to keep communication open as programs move closer to commercial manufacturing. So the vendor management as well as the supply chain functions become critically important in these interactions so that it's a holistic approach across the company, across all of the disciplines and the supply chain. Finally, the most important is also to have transparency and forecasting and open constant communication and something from a lessons learned perspective is important to integrate during these processes so you can share and understand the success of the milestones or the gaps. Of course, some advantages of this approach, what we see is that it forces proactive approach. It really helps to develop the lead and lead to resolutions of issues rather than trying to come up with workarounds. It also helps to force a department or a specific discipline to capture process knowledge and make informed decisions. The disadvantages be, can also be that activities related to a transfer, for example, can still be at risk, meaning you still have to rely on the availability, the flexibility of an external CMO, a contract testing lab, an academic partner, or, or an industry partner, which may be outside your control. So managing that, the expectations, the timing, and the understanding become critical. So therefore, as I said before, approaching these relationships as a partnership and sharing in the success is key and rewarding for everyone involved. At the end of the day, I think it's important because you're trying to bring treatments and cures to potentially patients, and we're all working towards the same goal in the end. So once that happens and that discussion happens internally and the decision about how to approach this tactically, the supply chain becomes the first focus. It becomes the immediate focus. The place to start is on the high-risk areas of control, especially the handoff points along the supply chain of custody, from procurement to manufacturing to administration, especially as you transition, for example, from an academia into an external support function and understanding those areas of control and that everyone understands that appropriately. Each of these steps have considerable amounts of coordination necessary to ensure that the approaches that are selected are scalable. And as you all know, it's very complex for one patient, but finding a solution that can support thousands and tens of thousands of patients can be daunting and costly. Still, all of this is critical and it has to happen quickly in order to maintain safety and strive towards commercial success. Taking a moment to look at the overall logistics involved, you have to consider the controls and the coordination of the procurement process. 
You have to consider whether to validate, for example, shippers or monitor shippers for temperature and location, how to build in a raw material program that may not exist internally or at a vendor to support both U.S. and global studies and understand the requirements that may be different. You have to work to ensure compliance with all the customs, import, export requirements, and in the case of a gene-modified situation, GMO documentation at a global level. And finally, where's the final interface, interface of the traceability system at dose administration, and where, how far do you take that from a needle-to-needle -needle strategy? These are all decisions you have to make in a collaborative, cross-functional way. As I said before, selection of a scalable traceability solution is the key to several achievements from a logistical perspective. There are several approaches to this, such as leveraging existing vendors that have a solution existing already, taking control to build that solution internally to be able to satisfy specific needs, with the risk being that there's a considerable investment build from an infrastructure perspective, IT, quality systems that may be required to do this. Or you can rely on a vendor solution that leverages the best practices in the industry, which is a, a good selection of a choice if you think about a scalable solution and the innovation that's in the field currently. However, even with a solution such as this, you may still have to rely on overlapping tools to make it as close to perfect as possible. For example, one solution may be great for, from a traceability perspective, but needs to be reworked or customized from an inventory management perspective to ensure the traceability as well as the security of the supply chain for per run. For manufacturing, it's well accepted that it's important to take a life cycle approach to the process understanding. Evolve with the manufacturing strategy as it progresses through development and take an integrated risk-based approach to this development. When a company is small, for example, there may be some success and the development pathway may be accelerated, so building strategically through outsourced activities can help select sustainable and commercially viable scalable options early on. Overall, keeping optionality and adapting this program's advance could benefit from a more holistic approach across the supply chain, as I've talked about previously. So taking a look at a potential integrated approach at the high level, you have to assess program portfolio needs and address requirements and risks through thoughtful planning. An integrated approach always keeps regulatory, quality, compliance, readiness in mind through an appropriate change control process if necessary. The challenges, of course, are being able to balance all of this with the fact that oftentimes a company or an academic facility is trying to build this as quickly as possible while executing the day-to-day -day activities to have a successful therapy. So diving a little bit deeper into the questions here about raw materials, understanding the level of control that's needed, the vendor's qualification activities, when to identify and qualify secondary suppliers and the, and the risk of a supply chain uh, problem in terms of getting a raw material. Looking at the starting materials, thinking earlier on about where the commercial supply could come from and is it scalable manufacturing. Thinking about drug product, are the capable facilities from a scale-out perspective to be able to support the need? Are the scalable options from a manufacturing perspective platform approaches that we can use to support multiple programs so you can benefit from time and expertise later on in your development. And then, of course, the infusion and the control, ultimately, for the traceability for patient safety. I think coming back to an important point is that the clinical and commercial success starts with the process understanding, whether it's supply chain, manufacturing, policy documents, validation approaches and so on, it's important to leverage as much existing knowledge as possible, whether that's through partnerships from strong academic facilities and partners that have done this before or building that know-how in-house. At a minimum, working to improve control and understanding through these mechanisms can help mitigate and minimize product quality or safety challenges as they arise.
taking the example of process understanding, it's always a good opportunity to look at the life cycle approach from a manufacturing perspective. From early starting material production methods to more scalable solutions that have worked elsewhere in the industry and leveraging that new know-how and expertise to fit into existing platforms. From lab scale solutions to new innovation and custom solutions for commercial manufacturing on the cell manipulation end of things. From a cell processing perspective, it's exciting to see that vendors are now making the investment to innovate and find solutions to existing challenges in the field, including linking the needs across the supply chain. We're getting closer to a fully integrated needle-to-needle -needle solution from patient to device and back to patient, and it only comes with collaboration in the field and understanding the needs of the field from a patient perspective where we can innovate together with the vendors in that way. I think there's a great opportunity to build these tools early in development if possible. And as the field advances together, that know-how will hopefully be shared, and we can all benefit from that. Another good example of this would be the harmonization of controls and standards, which is something we can also collaborate together as a field via existing agencies such as NIST and coming up with new standards that would benefit the entire field. Of course, with these opportunities come some risk in how to minimize expense, maximize control and flexibility. It can be approached in a variety of ways from a partnership with a CMO, a strategic partnership, a joint venture, or even complete control from an own facility perspective. Purchasing of a facility, building out that infrastructure, IT, quality, and systems is obviously a decision that's later on in the development, but as we see the successes of these, it, these types of therapies in the field that we're experiencing, that may become accelerated and the need for that may become even more important as we see more joint ventures and partnerships coming up in the coming years. Taken together, the elements of a successful deployment may leverage decades of knowledge and understanding and it's important to recognize that and to work with the leaders in the field. It certainly translates into in, and integrates across multiple modalities that may come from innovation of this existing framework, but also look to others to build on it based on other experience and different types of therapies. Or, of course, you can balance both internal and external partnerships to help mitigate this risk, which is beneficial for everyone involved from a timeline perspective as well as mitigating any risk to a patient based on leveraging existing clinical data. In conclusion, now that these therapies are progressing, there's a genuine development opportunity in bridging them to commercial products that may impact patient lives. The success of a safe and scalable needle-to-needle -needle solution depends on the management of a very complex supply chain that I've illustrated briefly here today. Process understanding is crucial to overcoming challenges when they arise, and characterization and ultimately validation are central elements to achieving successful deployment. With that, thank you for your attention. Back to you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, that was a great explanation of the challenges of needle-to-needle -needle logistics when providing cell-based therapeutics. And you touched on another core attribute, cost of goods. This, along with manufacturability, will now be discussed by our second speaker, Richard Grant. Richard has more than 30 years of product development experience across the biomedical, cell therapy, and industrial product fields. A member of Invitec for more than 15 years, Richard has been instrumental in building Invitec's cell therapy automation capability and continues to have a deep involvement in projects ranging from drug discovery and cell separation instruments to functionally closed automated cell therapy production systems. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Brian, and thanks everyone for attending. Actually, we've got um, 72 people from around the world attending, but I guess not many of them are uh, here in Australia at the moment at 4.20 a.m. Um, moving uh, into uh, talking about the, the topics that Brian just introduced, manufacturability and um, and cost of goods or total cost of, uh, of treatment. Uh, I do apologize um, 
a little bit for this uh, this first slide. It's, uh, it's somewhat complex, but it's meant to give the uh, impression of how complicated this whole process is, even uh, with a successful therapy being processed in, in the lab by manual highly skilled operators. There's a very long journey from there to a commercial solution. Um, the first four items here, product, process integrity, product quality, scalability, and flexibility, very much into how you manufacture your therapy. Um, regulatory, of course, has to be uh, is critical. Uh, and then operator skill cost of goods and the capital cost and utilization of, of the equipment and facility to do the manufacture is uh, you know, very much the, the key components of the uh, end therapy cost. Um, so the, what this slide is meant to do is illustrate how the relative level of importance of all of these factors changes as you progress from pre-IND all the way through to commercial production. Some of them are quite low initially when you're establishing your company and, and just testing whether the therapy works or not. It's very important to have highly skilled operators, uh, good flexibility in how you do your process and generally companies have little money so keeping the cost of things low is very important. As you progress further into achieving a commercially producible therapy, some of these things change quite dramatically. So uh, you, you find that you know, process integrity, product quality, scalability, all those things are, are critical to having a therapy which can be produced at a consistent quality and, um, and in a repeatable amount so that you don't know, get variability between doses. So moving along, We've got a few um, components here that, uh, that talk to the manufacturability and, and total product cost. Um, just want to highlight, you know, if you don't have product quality consistency and repeatability of process or the manufacturing process, you don't have a product. Um, aseptic processing enables you to provide uh, flexibility of processing and capital usage, and scalability obviously is the platform for, for growth and maintaining. Uh, a, a saleable and effective product around the world. A total product cost, what we have here, it's more than just cost of goods. I think a lot of people just concentrate on you know, how much does it cost me to produce the therapy in my facility, but um, there are a number of factors that impact um, the total product cost as delivered to the patient, which really needs to be considered quite early. You've got your, your cost of goods, you know, the obvious drivers such as how many disposables you're using, what labour is going into the manufacture, how do we use the, the least reagents possible to, um, to produce a good therapy. But there are you know, more complicated financial considerations about the cost of equipment used to manufacture the, the product, how we uh, design our facility, how we utilise that facility. And then finally, as Mike talked about, you know, the logistics of um, sample collection, manufacturing, distribution and administration. Many companies have not even you know, got their heads around what that looks like uh, and they're still taking the journey towards the clinic. Just uh, waiting for the next slide. So drop, drilling into a little more detail, um, looking at the, the quality, consistency and replayability, you know, our approach at Invitec when we've been helping our clients take their therapies to market is to, to, look, to really look at automating the skill-based manual steps and those highly variable steps which, which um, vary from batch to batch. And obviously when you're talking autologous and allogeneic um, therapies, you've got different challenges within each of those. But one key element here is uh, you know, how do we take the skill out of this process? How do we take it from one of our highly trained researchers who may have been involved in discovering uh, the therapy and the implications that can have for human health and how do we take that to, to some process that can be done by a, a lesser trained individual at a different company uh, on the other side of the world in the middle of the night. Um, so we do that by defining and controlling the process sequence so it is always executed the same way. Um, every step within that process has to be um, manipulated in the same way at the same temperature with the same flow rate, you can't have variability in the process. I mean, we're in a fascinating industry here where the um, variability of our starting material, the cells, uh, is, is highly variable, uh, especially in um, you know, cases where you're dealing with sick patients with an autologous therapy. So 
any variability we can reduce from the manufacturing process is going to give us a better chance of producing a, uh, a therapy that uh, is consistent in quality and, and repeatable in the number of cells you get out and the method of action of those uh, cells um, taking the body. So the second thing we concentrate on manufacturability is you know, how do we uh, process things aseptically. Uh, we need to close the process to achieve uh, you know, all, all the sterile stuff, um, uh, disposable stuff coming in. How do we keep maintaining that process in that, at that level of asepsis um, throughout a facility, which you know, in the old way when we were doing this in the lab was open processing in a biosafety cabinet in a class um, seven clean room. And we need to take that into a manufacturing model, which is uh, you know, a much more affordable one to, to roll out at scale. So how do we enable uh, the, how do we design the equipment so it can be used flexibly? How do we design the facility so it's used flexibly? Um, particularly a, a driver here for us is to drive the facility to the lowest grade of clean space. Ideally, a common larger processing area at the lowest possible level of, of clean space. So scalability, here we find scalability uh, differs between scale out, which is appropriate for autologous therapies, and scale up, which is uh, you know, for those allogeneic therapies. And having the ability to do this and having a, a model about how you distribute and locate your manufacturing centers. You know, are you doing a centralized manufacturing in a bulk allogeneic therapy and you're distributing frozen um, doses around the world to many places? Or do you have more of a point of treatment model for, a, for an autologous um, therapy? Those things will dictate very much what your company looks like, how you deliver the therapy to the patient and, and what the cost profiles come up in the, in the next two pages. Um, when we're talking about scalability, uh, what we're really looking at is process development. How do we select a scalable process that we can uh, either scale out or scale up and maintain the cell journey through the manufacturing process that uh, it doesn't see a condition different in the bulk manufacturing zone from when it was a manually produced therapy. So how do we maintain the cell journey during scaling to maintain efficacy and the critical quality attributes of the product. Um, we have to characterize the you know, process development folk are involved in characterizing and understanding the process drivers to ensure comparability. So many of the aspects we've talked about uh, in, the, in the first half of this presentation are, are you know, directly affecting our ability to, to do the manufacture but their knock-on effect is you know, what impact do they have on, on total product cost. So we need to understand early in the, in the journey of taking a therapy to market is that process development needs to continue until we freeze. Um, as I said before, we want to ensure that the cell's journey is consistent, uh, whether it's made in a batch of one or whether it's made in, in, in an autologist um, sense. You know, we're doing a thousand batches a week. The cell journey has to be the same. So as we accept, as we go through our clinical trials, the process changes get progressively more difficult to implement. Um, we need to address those elements of the process that can be optimized early on um, in our regulatory journey so that we can reduce reagent usage, minimize process times, look at how we utilize capital equipment uh, in the manufacturing process, and um, now we've got charts here um, showing on the graphics here of some of the, the uh, cost reductions that can be achieved on therapies as you go from a manual open process to an automated closed but still unit process um, manufacturing process to a, a fully automated closed and integrated product. And you, you know, in this particular case of 10,000 savings, the uh, 10,000 patients a year, the saving is uh, $87 million across the company. So key steps in uh, achieving this are uh, make sure you understand the cost drivers of the manufacturing process. Eliminate unnecessary processes. Avoid the costs of non-viable processes. So take steps out of a process that might have been used in the, in the research um, 
uh, lab to uh, you know gather data and you know, understand what's really happening, but they're not adding value in the manufacturing process. Uh, select appropriate scalable process technologies, as I said earlier. Integrate process steps together so that we reduce the uh, use of equipment and eliminate those highly skilled um, interventions by operators. So, uh, other elements of total prior cost, other than just the cost of goods, you know, in the manufacturer as we looked on the previous slide, is you know, how do we get the best equipment and facility utilization in our manufacturing um, area? So. We find that a key driver here is minimising the high-grade clean space areas in the in the uh, factory, um, maximising the throughput, the, the process throughput on high-cost equipment. So if you've got a very expensive piece of equipment and every process has to go through that, how do you make sure that your cells are going through that very quickly? And if uh, you know, as the other side of that coin, if you have you know, long incubation steps or cell culture steps, for example. How do you treat those with the lowest capital um, solution? So, have you got a common piece of equipment or a common area where you can do uh, a five-day incubation, a ten-day incubation, or as one of our clients has, a ten-week incubation? So, you really want to drive the cost of the equipment that's doing those long-duration process steps down as low as possible. And if there is complicated, expensive equipment, make sure that your product is going through that very quickly. Um, the two charts here for number of operators to meet patient demand per year and the clean room area comparison are quite typical of uh, you know, some of the savings that we've been able to assist our clients in achieving in reducing the number of operators and the skill level that those operators have and how we reduce the clean room area um, or the clean room space both in area and level of clean room uh, and uh, you know the level of clean clean room quality really is driven by the annual cost to maintain that um, clean room at that high level um, over the year. So um, in terms of logistics, I think Mike's first graphic here is a great map of the high level steps as we go through that, but the factors we need to consider here are you know, where do we collect our, our um, set and the, you know, starting product from? How do we ship it? What conditions is it shipped in? There's any number of manufacturing logistics about scheduling, um, traceability throughout the manufacturing facility. Do we run a fresh versus program, you know, uh, fresh versus frozen manufacturing cycle? Here we have um, the challenges of, of fresh, which is, you know, Everyone prefers to work with a fresh product versus the convenience of, of a frozen product. Uh, just one freeze four step in a manufacturing process gives amazing robustness to the processing and scheduling through a factory. Um, obviously, that carries on to, to the outbound product. The fresh distributing and delivering a fresh product has all sorts of logistical challenges and costs associated with it, whereas a frozen product can be done uh, much more in a scheduled manner and much more robustly with regard to weather interruptions of flights and the like. Um, but obviously you have to weigh up uh, the efficacy of the final product with, um, with that free store step involved in, in the manufacture. Um, other logistical considerations are, you know, do we have a centralized versus distributed manufacturing model? Um, you know, do we bring the patient to the site where we take a sample from them, process it, and bring them back to deliver it to them, or do we send it out to a, uh, a, a patient center where they just get processed during the day? The one thing that many customers, you know, many clients haven't thought about is, you know, how do we control that process of administration at the clinical site? You know, how do we train the operators there? How do we assure that, assure that they have the skills that we need, and how are we maintaining that that process is the same at every uh, every site around the globe? So I've, I guess, covered a lot of material fairly quickly here. Um, this is a, a multivariate problem. You need to focus on more than just efficacy early on. Uh, understanding the process development journey that you may need to undertake, uh, you need a clear plan for that for both uh, the investment, so you're ba uh, balancing your, your clinical program versus the 
um, design and and, uh, and capital projects that are needed to build a facility and make sure the equipment works. And you can match that clear plan so that the process is developing and being scaled as, as you run through, uh, I guess, the engineering and, and physical projects required to achieve that. Um, our recommendation is that companies you know, do some planning early, develop a stage approach that allows them the appropriate flexibility to be able to respond to, to changing market conditions and their progress through the, the clinical journey. So with that, I think, uh, Brian, it's time to hand back to you and we can move on to Mark Curtis. Thank you, Richard. Um, as you outlined, there is a significant change in high-level product requirements as you progress through clinical trials and into commercial production. I think there's also a similar change in how we approach reimbursement during the development of cell-based therapies, which is the fourth core attribute on today's agenda. I'd like now to introduce our third and final speaker, Mark Curtis, as he shares with us new ways of looking at the reimbursement landscape. Mark is an analyst at the Centre for Commercialisation of Regenerative Medicine in Toronto. CCRM is a translational centre established with the mandate of bringing regenerative medicine and cell therapy technologies into the clinic and through to market. Mark focuses on technology evaluation and due diligence and company formation slash incubation activities. As part of CCRM's consulting business, he also assists companies with clinical and reimbursement strategies. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to ISCT and Invitec for the invite today. So this first slide is something we're all quite familiar with, the life of a biotechnology product, which is broken down into three primary phases, research and development, commercialization, and patent expiry. There's some rough timelines I've included here as well. Now, wedged in between the R&D phase and commercialization phase, there is the process of HTA pricing and reimbursement. And the point of this slide is quite simply that revenue generation um, does not follow registration of a product, rather it follows the successful navigation of pricing and reimbursement discussions with payers following approval. And providing adequate data is generated by a manufacturer to support the efficacy of a product and that the manufacturer and payer are able to agree on the pricing of that product, then money flows from the payer to the manufacturer, at which time the payer assumes a certain degree of risk around the health benefits that that technology will provide. So it's not regulatory approval that we are ultimately seeking, it's reimbursement, because reimbursement is um, what leads to both the treatment of patients and revenue generation for a company. There are some key differences between regulatory approval and reimbursement. Regulatory approval requires evidence of safety, efficacy, and quality, and significance in clinical data. Reimbursement, on the other hand, requires evidence of safety and efficacy, and in some instances, cost effectiveness, depending on the jurisdiction where a product is sold. However, reimbursement often, uh, often requires peer-reviewed publications in support of a product's efficacy, so the data requirements are typically more intensive. In addition to that, longer patient follow-up is required and there's more emphasis placed on the durability of patient response. Reimbursement also introduces the question of affordability. Cost effectiveness does not necessarily mean a therapeutic will be aff affordable. If you look at Sovaldi, for example, which is cost effective at a treatment price of $80,000 per patient, um, but not affordable if the expectation is that all hepatitis C patients are to be treated immediately. Um, due to the size of the patient population. So data sets for regulatory approval and reimbursement are different, but it's important to note that uh, the collection of this data has to happen in parallel. Some of the differences I pointed to are captured in this excerpt from an ARM reimbursement report on regenerative medicine. Um, if you haven't got around to reading this report, I suggest you try and find it. It's a good overview of the reimbursement process in the United States and its implication on, uh, for regenerative medicine products, and under that I would include cell and gene products as well. And the quote is, it is very important to keep in mind that coverage looks at clinical outcomes in patients. This may be different from benchmarks that the FDA establishes for review and approval of products. The durability of the clinical result is also very important. Health plans often want to see patients follow 
for a longer time than the FDA may require. This is a visual put together by ARM recapping the current state of the clinic in regenerative medicine and advanced therapies. As you can see, we are operating in a time when the clinical pipeline is very robust, more than 570 clinical trials underway, almost 60 of which are in um, phase three clinical studies. And the point here being that there are a lot of advanced products coming down the pipeline, a good number of which are near commercialization. And if we look at what's going on in the global health care environment, we can see that irrespective of where you are in the developed world, health care costs have been rising steadily. And this is a chart here showing health care costs as a percentage of GDP um, in a number of nations. You can see that the United States is a clear outlier by a significant margin, spending approximately twice any of its peer group countries, both as a percentage of GDP and on a per capita basis. Um, the U.S. is currently spending about 18% of its GDP on health care. And the takeaway message from this, this slide, along with the last, is that we have um, a large number of innovative, expensive technologies moving towards commercialization at a time when healthcare cost containment is a key mandate of governments globally. Now, in one light, light this is a little concerning. Um, in another light, though, this picture should actually support the commercialization of advanced products, given that they're being developed to cure patients with chronic disease and cancer rather than simply treat patients on an ongoing basis. So what are the implications of this for the cell and gene therapy industry? Um, number one, cost of goods reduction and bioprocess optimization will have to be an essential component of cell and gene therapy development programs from an early stage. Um, both Michael and Richard alluded to that in their uh, respective presentations. And number two, clinical development of cell and gene therapies must be performed through the lens of value uh, to the patient and payer. So what is value? Well, how value is assessed varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. NICE in the UK and CADIF in Canada will implement quantitative cost-effectiveness models and things like willingness to pay for quality thresholds and incremental cost-effectiveness ratios to evaluate a technology. Um, reimbursement in these jurisdictions has historically been more black and white than, say, in the United States, where payers like Kaiser Permanente and Blue Cross Blue Shield put more uh, focus on efficacy alone and will look to value-based pricing strategies in the re reimbursement of advanced, of advanced medicinal products. I should note, however, that there seems to be consensus now amongst European payers that cost-effectiveness will have little impact on reimbursement of advanced therapies and that resources sh in, should instead be allocated to improving affordability of these technologies. So the definitions of what value are um, are in flux. I'd like to talk a little bit more about value-based pricing because I, I think this is a really critical concept for manufacturers to consider when having a price, pricing and reimbursement discussions with payers. Value-based pricing is determining the price of a product based on value delivered to the payer or patient rather than the cost of developing a product or historical pricing. And I've taken a few points here from a correspondence piece that was recently published in Nature Biotechnology entitled The Payer's Perspective on Gene Therapies to illustrate this thinking in the context of gene therapy as a solution to enzyme replacement therapy for lysosomal storage disorders. Some gene therapy developers currently believe it's reasonable to price a gene therapy um, <clears throat> at uh, multiples of the annual cost of chronic treatment, whereas many payers believe that this approach is artificial and argue, in fact, that enzyme replacement therapy is exorbitantly expensive and has never been cost effective. In the payer's eyes, a more rational approach is to use organ transplant as a proxy, um, as the objective of gene therapy is to return function to the body. So this begins to give you a sense of what to expect in having pricing discussions with payers. So this is a quote from a U.S. payer that I found thought-provoking. It's taken from the same article as the last slide. <clears throat> Gene therapies may be, may be a blessing in disguise. They could finally push us to the point where Medicare cannot fund drug therapies anymore, and therefore to where the U.S. has to undergo drastic rethinking of drug benefit evaluation and pricing. And many people also think we need to be thinking about new modes of payment, which brings us to pay for performance. 
So one of the greatest challenges faced by manufacturers of advanced therapies is that clinical stu study enrollment is very small. This is particularly the case with gene therapies. A late-stage gene therapy trial may only have uh, 25 or 30 patients as the size of the clinical um, as the size of the clinical data sets gets smaller and smaller, the uncertainty in the evidence base increases, which translates to greater and greater risk for the payer. As a result of this, there has been a good deal of discussion in recent years around the idea of pay for performance models or annuities where the risk is shared between manufacturer and payer. In my eyes, this is somewhat of a win-win situation because more risk is mitigated for the payer while the odds of reimbursement are increased for developers. And the way pay for performance works in principle is that the manufacturer receives a payment from the payer so long as the health benefit is provided to the patient. Overall, an annuity reduces the financial strain for the payer, the so-called sticker shock of the upfront payment, and also has a predictable impact on the healthcare budget. At the end of the day, the challenge is finding a framework that satisfies the payer's need for risk mitigation while providing revenue to manufacturers and ensuring that innovation keeps moving along. Of course, this type of approach is challenging to implement in the confines of current health systems, uh, particularly the United States, so this thinking remains largely theoretical at this point in time. I thought this was interesting data. This is taken from the same nature biotech correspondence piece that I referenced earlier. This data is from a survey of 29 pairs in the United States and Europe on what their preferred mode of payment would be in both a theoretical context, i.e. without the confines of current systems or a real world context. And what the authors found is that in the theoretical context, many pairs would, would indeed prefer an annuity model with a cap, which isn't all that surprising as this um, combination mitigates quite a bit of risk. However, in the real world scenario where we currently exist and will probably be for some time to come, and I think this is a positive finding for developers of advanced therapies, 70% of payers indicated they are happy um, with an upfront payment so long as pricing is value-based. So in summary, understand the differences in data requirements for approval and reimbursement, engage payers early, and build out a reimbursement data package in parallel with clinical studies, know your jurisdictions, its payers, and their data needs, implement value-based pricing and discussions with payers, and if you can, find proxies that demonstrate comparable value, and be open to the possibility of untraditional modes of payment. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Brian. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. Um, so just to wrap things up, you can see that successful commercialization of a cell therapy requires more than just proving safety and efficacy to the regulators. Yes, efficacy is important, Without it, there is no therapy. It is critical for cell therapy companies to think beyond efficacy and have a plan in place for how they will successfully move from the clinic to commercial scale production. To enable a successful progression to commercialization, each of the five elements, essential elements, needle to needle logistics, manufacturability, cost of goods, reimbursement, and efficacy must be considered in order to build a solid foundation for game-changing product developments. So this concludes the presentation segment of the webinar. We will now open it up for questions. As a reminder, you may submit your questions using the chat box located to the left of the slides. Um, and just to get the ball rolling there, um, I have uh, a question there for, for Richard. Um, you're looking there on, on your first slide, you know, you map clinical development and transition into commercial scale manufacturing and the changing emphasis on different manufacturing requirements. It's really putting together a, uh, a commercialization plan. When, when should companies developing uh, cell therapies start exploring uh, these questions around manufacturability and cost of goods, et cetera? Thanks, Brian. Um... It's a, a good question because obviously early stage companies are very much looking at husbanding the cash they have available. Um, our recommendation would be that as soon as you have uh, a stable process um, that you're working on, so maybe that phase one um, trial is going into phase two, 
where you you now have a, a method of manufacture that you're thinking is pretty much the core of how it, it may stay. Um, that's when you need to start looking at the technologies um, and uh, and the implications of using those technologies on your on your therapy production. So it's from my perspective a good time to to actually have a a look at the technologies out there, a look at the process and where the difficulties are or will be in manufacturing and, and where the, where the costs will be. You can do a study at that point and then actually have a timing of your development plan and, and the cost of implementing that plan and not actually progress to, to further work to actually um, uh, build that out. But if you don't know what the path is, then, then you're going to struggle later on when you may have locked yourself into a position you can't move from. So, my thoughts about doing that, uh, that work and, and coming up with a, a plan are uh, that yeah, phase one, phase two is probably the, the ideal time to do that. You can then perhaps uh, start some limited development to get some equipment to take you through phase two and phase three volumes um, before going to a full implementation when you hit commercial scale. Thanks, Richard. Um, there's just a couple of questions. Uh, uh, asking around the availability of the presentation from today, and I'll just uh, mention some details around that when we uh, wrap up uh, this morning's session. Um, but it certainly will be available. Uh, another question um, coming for, for Mark. Um, what can clinical R&D cell therapy companies do to plan and prepare for reimbursement issues? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I think the most important thing is to begin the engagement process early, and I think that, you know, even as you enter the clinic, you can be thinking about who you should be contacting to begin the process of um, understanding the reimbursement around your product or technology. And as an example, I'll use a, I'll use a local program here in Toronto. That we have a program here called Mars Excite. And, you know, traditionally, reimbursement data has been generated following regulatory approval. Um, what Mars Excite is doing is taking that data generation from the post-market um, uh, stage into the pre-market phase. And they, they bring together the regulator, the payer, and the developer around one table to try and help design clinical studies that will not only provide the data that is required for uh, regulatory approval, but the, the data that is also required for reimbursement. And in here in um, Ontario, we have a, a, a committee called the Ontario Health Technology Assessment Committee, which is actually a subcommittee of Mars Excite, and OTAC uh, provides recommendations to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario. So the Mars Excite program actually gives a stamp of of, of, of approval in a way of the technologies coming down the pipeline insofar as that they said that yes, this is a, a product that we are interesting, interested in paying for. So I would say, um, you know, engage pairs as early as possible. If there are any programs similar to Mars Excite, um, be involved in those programs. Great. Thanks, uh, Mark. Um, another question. Uh, it's probably a little bit to, I guess, Mike and, and Richard, um, saying, could you describe the worst scenario you experienced in tech transfer from academic to industry? I'm not sure, um, you know, maybe Richard, with the project experience that we have, you can comment on that? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good question and I, I would, I guess, take issue with worse um, um, because, you know, when we talk to people, you know, they're, they're very intelligent people and they're doing the best they can uh, to try and, you know, push the boundaries of healthcare back. But I would certainly, if you substitute worse there to, to say most complicated, uh, say that the work that we've done for Argos Therapeutics where they have... Uh, you know, two streams that they extract uh, and amplify RNA from uh, a kidney tumour and then they have a, a multi-stage um, one-week process where they uh, mature the peripheral blood mononuclear cells into mature dendritic cells and then freeze and distribute for, for administration. 
that has more steps and more complicated steps than any other process that we've seen. But we've been able to assist them in developing the equipment that makes it uh, more than likely that they will be able to um, take that to the, the clinic in an affordable way. Uh, Mike, have you got thoughts on this one? I agree. There's, I think the um, there's no worse scenario. I think they've all been fantastic in terms of working with academic partners. I think to highlight the the difference, um, what we've learned is just the l level of rigor around some of the regulatory requirements for GMP manufacturing in the U.S. as well as Europe, specifically things, for example, around aseptic qualifications and validation, and even process validation. Understanding that just you. Just because you run a process three times doesn't mean you validated the process. Um, the validation process, a quality by design approach, or actually implements characterization, documented characterization, PPQ analysis, actually process performance qualification runs and validations. But as far as uh, I agree with you, there's really it's, it's just the extra work that has to go into um, getting ready for commercial manufacturing and an approved product. But I don't, I don't, ha I don't have any examples of worst case situations. Yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, Richard and Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, another question for you. You, you mentioned the role of uh, NIST in harmonization and standards. They've been largely focused so far on improving confidence and measurements of critical quality attributes. What measurements and standards does, do, you, do you think are um, most important for the manufacturing process? Sure. I think I think the only thing I can speak to is from experience, um, especially from uh, a stem cell perspective, and harmonizing to different cell banks or ways in which for a gene therapy program, for example, how the industry looks at titer. So everyone looks at different ways of titering their gene delivery, whether it's a, a different vector system, and how folks are titering based on a permissible cell line or based on a cell line that is actually used in, in the clinical setting. So then we can all work together and think about new technologies and new ways to better that, those technologies if we're all in the same starting uh, point. So I think that those are two examples. I think thinking about each indication, I can only speak from autologous cells uh, as well as sort of a lentiviral vector perspective and, and other vector systems, but having standardization and not, not to judge yourself against someone else, but actually help to improve um, whether it's a partnership or relationship with vendors and, and that everyone can actually progress in making the best therapy across the field uh, to treat as many patients as possible and all of us collectively understanding and learning from experience through those standards. Thanks. Uh, another question for Richard. Um, how does minimizing skilled labor translate to product cost reduction for a GMP process? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of complexity about the answer to that. So minimising the skilled labour takes out um, obviously the need to uh, recruit and hire people with those skills. So it does have a, an immediate impact on, on doing that. But the hidden impacts of of removing as much labour as possible from a process are actually in the long term more felt by the fact that you you don't have to manage so many people and, and managing recruiting and hiring and training um, highly skilled people and, and making them work in a repetitive um, sort of hands-on way. Um, they don't get as much job satisfaction. You know, they, these are PhD quality people who have been trained to use their brains and experiment. So they're continually looking to refine the process and, and change the process when in fact uh, as a factory you want that same process being operated over and over again. So, there's a number of benefits you get by um, taking the skilled labour out of the equation. The machines, as I like to say, make the same mistake every time. So once you've got the, the software or firmware correct, they're doing the same thing over and over again much more reliably than a person. They don't wake up with a hangover on Monday morning. Um, they don't uh, you know, decide to, to stay at home because you know, the Super Bowl's on or whatever. Um, so the, the costs... Um, they do change by, by process, so every um, instance we look at is, has a different impact of cost on that process, but it's really the um, benefits that you get in terms of process repeatability um, and the logistical 
um, challenges of manufacturing the therapy where the uh, reduction in labour comes off. I mean, as an engineer, and I've worked in a number of industries over the years, just removing people from the process rarely um, justifies uh, enough for the accountants, at least, the cost of going to an automated solution. Um, moving to automation um, pays for itself by the consistency of the product, the quality of the product you're getting out, and by the way that you can apply capital to the manufacturing process. So in this case, you know, you might have more expensive equipment, but it's operating in a lower grade clean room in a, in a ballroom type space. So the operating cost of that facility and the capital cost of that facility is where the reduction in labor has paid for itself. Thank you, Richard. I think that about uh, takes us out of time. So on behalf of all the speakers today, I would like to thank you for joining today's webinar. If you have any additional questions, you may reach out to the presenters directly using the email addresses here. Following this presentation, IFCT will be sending you an email with a webinar evaluation survey. IFCT has asked that you please take this opportunity to let them know which topics you would like to see in future ISCT webinars. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining and we ask that you please disconnect your lines.